أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤوده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم As we know that this ayah is known as ayat al-kursi because the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kursi is in this, uh, in this ayah. And once we get there, inshallah, we'll try to understand what does this kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which literally can be translated as chair, means when it comes to in reference with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu says, Once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked me, because Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu is known as Sayyid al-Qurra, the person who had the certificate, we can say, the title from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Sayyid al-Qurra, the leader of all the Qurra, the best Qari, So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiyallahu anhu Ayyu ayatin fi kitab Allahi indaka a'zam Which of the ayahs of Al-Quran that you know is the greatest? Initially Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiyallahu anhu did not want to answer because he wanted to hear it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this was Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'in's general habit that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would ask them something as a respect to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would say, Ya Rasulullah, Allah and His Messenger know the best. So you tell us the answer. And then once they will see that he's insisting on getting the answer from them, then they would give the answer according to their understanding if they know it. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu, which of the ayahs is the greatest? So Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu said, Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam know the best. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, but you know something about it, so which ayah of Qur'an is the greatest? Here we need to realize Kalamullah, the words of Allah, each and every word of Allah is greater than anything else in this universe. This whole universe and whatever it contains, everything that we feel has any value in this universe, really is valueless, has no value, has no importance whatsoever in comparison with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The words of Allah are the greatest things human beings have in this life. Out of this kalamullah, out of this Qur'an al-Kareem, if one ayah can be pointed out as the greatest ayah of Qur'an, subhanallah, you just imagine how great that must be. Using the word great for it, I think, is not enough, but that is the best word in our dictionary. And this is why just to explain to ourselves the word great is being used, there has to be a unique word for it that can be used only for this ayah. And then only human beings may have some understanding of the greatness of Kalamullah and especially of this ayah of Al-Quran Al-Kareem. So Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu says when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked me again, then I said to him, Ayat al-Kursi. 
That is Ayat Al-Kursi, Ya Rasulullah, which is the greatest ayah of Quran Al-Kareem. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put his hand on Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu's chest. And he said, congratulations for the ilm and knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have blessed you with. This tells us that Ayatul Kursi is the greatest ayah of Quran. And in one of the ahadith, in this hadith, the word azam, great, is used for Ayatul Kursi. In one of the ahadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in the Sayyidu Ayal Quran, the leader of all the ayahs of Al Quran, and the greatest ayah of Quran is Ayat Al Kursi. The word Sayyid, which is normally used for leader, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us the leader of all the ayahs of Al Quran is Ayat Al Kursi, which means. It's the greatest, it's ahead of every ayah in every way. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this universe, He always made one thing to lead the rest. So there is always leadership in everything. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ana Sayyidu Wuldi Adam. See the word Sayyid is used again. That I'm the leader of all mankind. Wala Fakhr. And he says, I'm not saying it out of arrogance. But this is a fact. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me Sayyidu Wuldi Adam. The leader of all mankind. Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam is Sayyidul Malaika. The leader of all angels. So there is leadership in everything. Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam is Sayyidul Malaika. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in the hadith, Sayyidul Shuhada'i Hamza. The leader of all shuhada is Hamza radiallahu anhu. So if we bring all the shuhada of the world from the time of Adam alayhi salam till the day of Qiyamah, who would be the leader of the shuhada? It will be Hamza radiallahu anhu. Sayyidatu Nisa'i Ahlil Jannah, Fatima, the leader of all women of Jannah, Fatima radiallahu anha. Sayyida Shababi Ahlil Jannah, Al Hassan Wal Hussein. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The leader of the youth of Jannah are Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhuma. Sayyida Kuhuli Ahlil Jannah, Tigayra Nabiyin. The leader of all the older people of the Jannah, other than Anbiya alayhimu salatu was salam, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma. The leader of the days of the week is Yawmul Jum'ah, Sayyidul Ayyam. The word Sayyid is used for Jum'ah, Sayyidul Ayyam, the leader of all the days of the week. Then the leader of the whole year, the days of the year, is the day of Arafah. Is the greatest day of the year. The leader of all nights, Laylatul Qadr. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the system of this universe. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is informing us that as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his kalam to us, the leader of all the ayahs of Al-Quran is Ayat Al-Kursi. Here we can imagine the greatness of this ayah. The month of Ramadan got the importance because Ramadan, because Quran was revealed during the month of Ramadan. Laylatul Qadr has its importance because Quran was revealed during Laylatul Qadr. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, first wahi, as we say he received the prophethood, was when he received the first ayahs of Surah Al-Alaq. Those ayahs of Surah Al-Alaq abrogated all the previous adiyan, Torah, Injil, Zabur, everything was abrogated by the beginning ayahs of the Quran Al-Kareem that was the beginning ayahs of Surah Al-Alaq. This is the power of Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, 
that the leader, Sayyidu Ayyul Quran, the leader of all the ayahs of Al Quran Al Kareem, is Ayat Al Kursi. This will just give us some understanding of the importance and the greatness of this ayah. This is why Ali radiallahu anhu used to say that I don't think there is any person who has, who is with his right mind, he would go to sleep without reciting Ayat al Kursi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he mentioned, the virtues and the importance of Ayat al-Kursi, he also instructed us to recite, recite Ayat al-Kursi at different occasions. For example, there are hadith that tell us that we should recite Ayat al-Kursi before we go to bed. Every night before a person goes to bed, before a person retires to sleep, should recite Ayat al-Kursi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in one of the hadith, if a person would recite Ayat al-Kursi, before going to bed, or at the time of going to bed, there will be malaika, angels protecting this person till the morning. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when you go to your bed, this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari, when you go to your bed, recite ayat al-Kursi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assign an angel to protect you and spend the night with you. So there is a malaika around this person. This person is sleeping and being in the company of the malaika. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A person who would recite ayat al-kursi at the time of going to bed, before sleeping, آمَنَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ دَارِي Allah will protect his house. وَدَارِ jari. And will protect the house of his neighbor. وَدُوَيْرَاتٍ حَوْلَهُ And few more houses in his neighborhood. Will be protected by one person recite, reciting Ayat al-Kursi there. Of course, greatest ayah of Al-Quran al kareem explains everything. That word by itself explains everything. And now if we mention all the virtues of the surah, really, there has to be something that we can say very <laughs> understandable because the greatest ayah of Quran. Which simply means the greatest thing that exists on this world, on the surface of the earth, the greatest thing that we have. There is nothing greater than this because Quran is the greatest. And out of the ayahs of Al-Quran, Ayat al-Kursi is the greatest. So then, what can be greater than Ayat al-Kursi that people have in this universe. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, advised us to recite ayat al-kursi before, uh, after every fard salah. And the hadith says, a person who would recite ayat al-kursi have the habit of reciting ayat al-kursi after every fard salah. لَمْ يَمْنَعُهُ مِنْ دُخُولِ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا أَنْ يَمُوتِ Nothing is stopping him from going to Jannah except being alive in this world. As soon as he would leave, the door of the Jannah would open for him. The barakah of reciting Ayat al-Kursi. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect this person's iman. Of course, what means that nothing will, is preventing him from going to Jannah except being alive. As soon as he would die, he would go to Jannah, which means, inshallah, this, person's, this person is going to have iman at the time of his death. His iman will, his iman will be protected until he will face Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A person who recites ayatul kursi after every first salah, kana fi dhimmatillahi ila salat al ukhra that person is under Allah's protection till the next salah. This person is under Allah's protection till the next salah. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised us to recite ayat al-kursi as a protection from against all the evils. Ayat al-kursi has a great power of protecting a person against 
jinns, shayateen, and against all the evils that can befall a human being in this world. In this world. Well-known hadith that is in Sahih al-Bukhari and other books of hadith. Ahadith. <clears throat> Narrated on the authority of Sayyidina Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, who says, وَكَّلَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ بِحَفْزِ زَكَاةِ رَمَضَانِ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked me to take care of the zakah that he collected during the month of Ramadan, maybe fitrah or maybe zakah that was collected during Ramadan. So he says, I, was, I had it at, at my home and I was making sure that no one can come and touch it. So I saw a man coming there and he was picking up some of the food from there. So I caught this person and said to him that you are stealing this, I will take you to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, فَشَكَا حَاجَةً وَعِيَالًا He started making, complaining about his situation and that how he's in need and he didn't have anything to eat and his children were also hungry for some time and he was really in need of some food and therefore he had to take some, he had no choice but to take some food from here. So, Abu Huraira radiallahu anh excused the person and said, okay, but make sure you don't do it again. Abu Huraira radiallahu anh says, night time when I met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked me, ma fa'ala asiru kal bariha? What did that person do, that man do yesterday? I didn't tell him anything. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew about it. So I said to him, Ya Rasulullah, he was stealing, I caught him, and then he said that he, has, he was hungry and his children were hungry, he didn't have anything to eat for some time. So I excused him, I said, okay, but make sure you don't do it again. Next day, the same person came back, and again he was stealing. So Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu caught him now, and he said, <laughs> Yesterday I caught you doing the same thing. Now you're doing the same thing again. Today I will take you to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa for sure. So again he started bringing all the same excuses and complaining. Then I felt sorry for him. And I said, you know, the poor guy, you know, his children must be really starving if he has to come and steal like this. And he has nothing to eat. And the way he was presenting his story, that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu thought, you know, it must be true. So, that person, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, let him go this time. Again, when he met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Ma fa'ala asiru kal bariha? Abu Huraira, what did that man do yesterday? I told him the same thing again. I told him the whole situation. He said, that this person would come back again. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he's going to come back again. Sabu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, Now I knew for sure he would be coming, and I started watching for him, looking for him, so that if he would come today, I had determined that for sure I would take him to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And really he came. And I caught him. And I said to him, This is the last time that I... Uh, yesterday was the last time I gave you the chance, and that is the third time that I see you stealing... And every day you promise you won't do it, and now this you're doing it again. Today, for sure, I would take you to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So again, he started making the same type of excuses. I said nothing is going to work today, and I would take you to Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was so scared to go to Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he said to me, "How about if I teach you something?" That would protect you against shayateen, against shay- or jinn, and against all the evils. Would you let me go? Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'in, of course, they loved knowledge. Oh, so you know something that would really be a protection against shaitan, against all jinns? He said, yes. I promise I will teach you something. If you recite it, shaitan will not be able to come close to you. And if you recite it at night time, till next morning, shaitan cannot be around you there. Sabu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, okay, I will let you go under that condition. So he said to me, recite Ayat al-Kursi every night. Recite Ayat al-Kursi. If you recite Ayat al-Kursi, shaitan will not be able to come close to you. 
Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu said, then I let him go. And when I met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked me, ma fa'ala asiruk? What did that man do yesterday, last night? I told him, Ya Rasulullah, this is what he did. And when I caught him this time, I said, for sure I will take you to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he said, that he promised that he would teach me something that will protect me against shaitan and against all the jinns. So, I thought that will be, that was a good deal to learn that from him and let him go. So, he taught me ayat al-kursi. The hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sadaqaka wa huwa kathub. He told you the truth, but he's a liar. Sadaqak wa huwa kathub. He told you the truth, but he's a liar. Do you know who you're dealing with all these three days? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that is shaitan, that is iblis. So shaitan, iblis, he was so scared to go to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he told Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu how to protect himself against shayateen, against himself, against shaitan and against all the other jinns. And that is through reciting Ayat al-Kursi. So Ayat al-Kursi is a protection against shayateen, against jinn. And now we learn that especially has to be recited after every fard salah. We should make a habit that after fard salah, we should recite Ayat al-Kursi. With Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Number two, reciting Ayat al-Kursi after uh, uh, before going to bed, before going to sleep. So every night as we are ready to sleep, we recite Ayat al-Kursi with other du'as that are prescribed in the hadith for, to be recited at the time of going to sleep. One of the well-known scholars of Islam, great muhaddis, whose name is Yahya ibn Ma'in, rahimahullah. It's been rated in a book called Seer A'lam al-Nubala that talks about the great scholars of Islam, the biography that this book talks about, the biography of the great scholars of Islam. So it has been written on the authority of Yahya ibn Ma'in in that book. He says that I used to recite Ayat al-Kursi five times every night. When I go to home, I would recite five, uh, Ayat al-Kursi five times as a just have it, my habit five times every night for protection for me and my children and my house against shaitan and jinns. So he said, one day I went home and as soon as I started it, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Allahu la ilaha, I started it and I heard someone saying that you recite this surah five times every day, so many times every day, you think no one else knows this ayah? You are the only person who knows this ayah? So Yahya ibn Ma'in says, I knew this is shaitan, this is jinn. And he's very upset with me that he's not getting opportunity at all to spend a night in my home. So this is why today he couldn't hold it anymore and he comes up and he's talking to me that you recited every night so many times, you think that no one knows this eye other than you? You are the only person who knows this eye in the world? So he says, I said to him that I can figure out that this ayah is really upsetting you. And therefore, now I'm going to recite it even more. So he said, from there on, I started reciting ayat al-kursi even more than that. So it's a great protection against shayateen and against jinns. One of the very important things to teach our children and make them develop the habit of reciting ayat al-kursi every day. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that this is, this ayah is the leader of all ayahs and the greatest ayah of Qur'an al-Kareem. What is the reason? Why is known to be the leader of all the ayahs? Why is it considered to be the greatest ayah of Qur'an al-Kareem? As we know, Qur'an al-Kareem has different sciences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in Qur'an al-Kareem. 
there are ahkam in Quran which means halal and haram, do's and don'ts, that these things are haram, these things are halal, these are faraid, these are thing, good things to do. Then there is another portion of Quran that deals with reminders. Reminders could be in the form of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminding us through Jannah, Jahannam, through uh, mentioning the stories of the previous nations. So reminders is another portion of Quran. And one portion of Quran is all about beliefs. Belief about Akhirah, about Allah, about Anbiya alayhimu salatu wassalam. It's all related to beliefs. And every believer knows that the most important thing is aqidah, is iman, is belief. If a person does not believe and he keeps on doing ibadah, his ibadah will not be accepted. But if a person has iman and no ibadah, God forbid, still someday he would make it to Jannah because iman is not there. So iman will protect him someday from the adab, from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although there was no amal, there was no practice. But iman was there. So iman is the most important. And especially when it comes to iman about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the most important thing for a human being to know and to learn. Who is Allah? Who is my Rabb? And what can be greater than learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the greatest thing to learn is to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, we can say, the greatest science a person can learn is deen. And in deen, the greatest thing that a person can learn is aqidah, believes. And in aqidah, the greatest portion of aqidah is the aqidah about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah is great and He is the greatest, Allahu Akbar. So, all the knowledge that is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest too. And Ayatul Kursi teaches us aqidah about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has some introduction about who our Rabb is. Allahu la ilaha illahu. Al Hayyu, Al Qayyum, La Ta'khuduhu Sinatun Wala Naum. As we go into the explanation of the ayahs, we will see that this ayah is telling us who our Rabb is. And therefore, this ayah is the greatest because it talks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, there are other ayahs that talk about Allah. Allah Himself and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that. Out of all the ayahs that talk about Allah, this ayah is the greatest. It contains the greatest knowledge about Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤوده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم This is Ayatul Kursi and we talked about the importance of this ayah in our previous session. And we also talked about the first portion of the ayah, Allahu la ilaha illahu. Allah, there is no God but Him. al Hayyul Qayyum. Just to keep in mind, this is the most important ayah, the greatest ayah of Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem. 
and therefore there is no way that we can get to the depth of the knowledge, information, wisdom and the blessings that are filled in this ayah. And this ayah talks about that also. That there is no way we can get to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So regardless of how much we try to understand the words and the message and the meaning of the ayah, still, it's nothing really. It's not even a dot comparing to the ocean. So, this is the greatest ayah of Quran al Kareem and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised the ummah to recite this ayah as much as possible in different occasions after prayers, before going to bed, at the time of hardships when a person is affected by jinns or protection against jinns and simply protections against all evils and hardships. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah la ilaha illahu. Allah, there is no God but Him. Al Hayyul Qayyum. The living, the sustaining. Al Hay. Normally the word Hay is used for any living being. But when we start comparing living beings and their lives and what type of life they have, we will realize that our life is nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a lot of, a lot of things that have life to it. And all of these things have different type of life. Insects have a life, animals have life, human beings have life, jinns have their life, malaika have a life. All of these are living beings that have their own type of life. And of course, as we know the plants and the trees, even these things have certain type of life. And this is why we say, the tree have died. So they all have different type of lives. When we start comparing these lives, some of these lives are nothing comparing to the other lives. This is why, if it comes to killing 100 animals to save one human being, every human being would say it's worth it Kill the hundred animals so at least we can save one life of a human being. So, when we compare that life with this life, we say this life is more valuable. And therefore, to save this life, we can take that life. How many insects we kill to protect small things, to protect our food? Because we understand that the life is nothing comparing to the value of other things. Now when we take all of these living beings, we will realize that all of these living beings, they were born someday and a time would come when they would die. So their life is temporary. And... Their life is out of their own control. No living creature has a control over his and her own life. When a person would lose it, no one knows. And how easily this life can go away, everyone knows that it's very easy. One bullet can take the life. A snake 
bites the person, takes the life. Scorpio takes the life. Dog, lion takes the life. So it can go away very easy. The strongest person can die at any time and no one can guarantee that he will live because of his power and strength. He has to live at least for 10 more years. So when we look at this life that we have, it's really nothing. And is not something that we can rely on that this has to be there for this many years before it would go away. There is no guarantee whatsoever. So now when we look at these lives, and then we look at Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has no beginning, no end. No end means, just like our life will go away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never die, al hayy he would never die. So, that life is the real life. And this is why the word Al-Hay, used as one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the living. Because the real living is Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone else that is living, his life is really nothing. It's not something that anyone can rely on. If a, a person at the time of choosing a friend or marrying a person, at the time of marriage, would put that condition that if you guarantee me that you will live for five years at least, then I'm going to marry you. Who would be able to fulfill that condition? No one. Guarantee me that you live for one year. And no one can guarantee it. How can I guarantee it? I don't know it. I have no control over it. So this life that we have is nothing. Al-Hay, the real Hay is Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the real life. That cannot be taken away. That is guaranteed. And that has no end to it. So this is why this Hay is used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah is Hay. He is the real living. And then the second attribute used for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al Qayyum, the sustaining. Really, Qayyum, if we look at the word and analyze the word, we will understand a better the meaning in a better way. It's not really the sustaining. But that may be the closest way of explaining and expressing the feeling of the meaning of the word. Qayyum is driven from the word Qama Yaqumu. Qama means to stand up. For anything to stand up, it needs some support. Everything needs some type of support to stand. Otherwise, it will fall. If you try to put the stick straight up, it will be falling down. Except if it will get a good support on the ground. And then it would be able to stand by itself as long as nothing would push it. Human beings, we stand on our feet. We may say that, okay, feet are part of our body, so we can stand without a support. Or I can stand without a support. We don't see the support. Of course, ground is there for sure, but let's even ignore that. And we will see that the really the thing that is supporting us is our ruh to stand up. If a person is standing up and dies, which means ruh goes out of the body, he will fall right away. That simply means he was being supported by something that was unseen 
but really there was a support. And this is after ignoring the fact that he is standing on the ground, his legs are holding there strongly and firmly, and if the ground was not straight, he may not be able to stand up. If there is a freezing rain and it's slippery, he will not be able to stand up over there, he will be falling down. So, everything needs a support to stand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about heaven and earth in Quran. وَيُمْسِكُ السَّمَاءَ أَن تَقَعَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ He holds the heaven from falling on the earth without his permission. So he's holding the heaven and he's holding the earth. As we see the earth is nothing, it's just a globe. And this is what it's uh, uh, hanging in the space. What's holding it? It seems like there is nothing that's holding it. And it's hanging up there. But of course we know, and even the science now tells us that there is a pressure out there in the space that is holding it. So there is something that is holding everything that is there. The earth holding us, holding the buildings, holding very heavy things that is on it. Mountains are holding the earth from shaking. But who is holding all of these things? There is someone that must be holding the mountains. There is someone that is holding the earth in its place. There is someone that is holding the sun in its place, that it doesn't go away from its place. Someone that is holding the moon, someone that is holding the stars. Who is holding all of these things? That is Qayyum. Qayyum means that everyone depends on him to stand. And he does not depend on anything else to stand by himself. He's standing by himself and everyone is standing with his support. Nothing can stand in this world without his support. He is Al-Qayyum. So this is the real meaning of Al-Qayyum. That holds everything in its place so things are standing. And if he would not provide that support, the thing is going to fall apart. Regardless of how strong, how powerful that thing may be, it's going to fall apart. He created so much power in the air that it holds huge aeroplanes that are up in the air and they are in the air with the, with the pressure and the power of the air. What's holding it? We all know that it's not that this aeroplane is standing by itself. There is a pressure over there. We created a machinery over there that will work with the wind, with the air in such a way there are huge wings over there that are working to keep the pressure of the air. So, these small things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created so much power in them that they are holding the aeroplanes. Our food is really holding us in place. A person doesn't get food for some days, will not be able to stand up. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Qayyum. Everything stands in this universe with His support. And He does not need anyone's support to stand. So if anyone really would like to stand, and take a real stand for anything, he needs the support from Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one can stand. No one can do anything on his own without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holding him in place and giving him the power to stand. The strongest people. You see the person laying on hospital's bed. What happened? 
I pulled my nerve. I pulled my muscle. Something, you know, small thing. This person was so strong that he would carry things that normally people would not be able to carry. But now he's laying down. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the only qayyum. The one who really stands without needing anything else. And everything that is qa'im, that is standing in this world, needs al-qayyum subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything needs al-qayyum. So Allah, there is no God but Him. The living, the sustaining. The one that is controlling everything, that is holding everything in its place. And these two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are very important, very powerful. In fact, some of the hadiths have indication that Ismullah al azam the great name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah loves, and they are, it's a name that is very powerful, very powerful, that is al Hayyul Qayyum. The combination of both of these, al Hayyul Qayyum. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make dua, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghith. Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghith. I seek the help of your rahmah. So, these are very powerful names of Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, because if you look at these two names, these two names are indicating towards the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the Hay, He is the living, everyone else is just dead. Comparing to Al Hayy Al Qayy Al Hayy, everyone else is dead. How long are you going to live? What type of life are you going to have? No guarantees. al Hay is the only one that has the real life. And al Qayyum, no one, even the living ones, cannot stand without having a support from al Qayyum subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no one can stand, no one can do anything without the power of al Qayyum subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the next sentence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا تَأْخُذُهُ سِنَةٌ وَلَا نَوْمٌ Neither slumber overtakes him, nor sleep. Now when we look at the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the next thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's control, that not only that he is living, he never sleeps because when a person sleeps, it's just like a dead person. Sleeping person is just like a dead person. A person who has fear of enemies and he's afraid that he could be attacked at any time, if it is within his control, he would never sleep. I'd like to know what's happening around me. But yet, <coughs> we find that every person sleeps. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not sleep. There is a narration, although it's very weak narration, but at least will give us some understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being in control at all times. And how when a person sleeps, gets out of control, the narration says, once Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was salam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, how do you control the whole universe at all times? Ya Allah, there is no time when you would need any rest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, No Musa, I don't need any rest. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Musa alayhi salatu was salam, A person who needs rest, he can never control everything else. And O oh Musa, to understand this, stay up for three days. So Musa a.s. was awake for three days. The third night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Musa a.s. Tonight, you hold two bottles of water in your hand, or you can say the glass of water in your hand, in both of your hands. Each hand hold one glass. And make sure that, and stand up for the whole night, with these glasses of water in your hand, make sure 
that water doesn't drip out of it and you hold the glass firmly throughout the night. So Musa alayhi salatu was standing up and he's holding to the glass of water and after some time he's getting a little sleepy. So of course as you know close his eyes and the hands goes down little water drip and quickly he gets up and he's holding to the glass now. And again the same thing is getting sleepy and hands are going down and he's trying to hold them up and gradually the water is dripping out of it and finally towards the end of the night he just lost the control and the glass fell off his hand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him Musa a person who sleeps cannot even hold a glass of water how can he will con- how can he control the whole world so la ta'khudhu sinatun wa la nawm as i said there is weakness in the narration, but it gives us the understanding that really a person who sleeps, he's out. He cannot hold anything. And Allah is Qayyum. He is holding everything. So, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would sleep, then everything will get out of control. So, everything is within the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. So, this portion of the ayah is telling us. The control of Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La ta'akhudhu sinna, neither slumbers nor sleeps. Which means, sinna is when a person not in his eyes, just in the head you start feeling sleepy. Even without closing the eyes. You feel in your head that now I need some rest, I'm getting sleepy. This is what sinna means in Arabic language. And of course, as that comes first, and then gradually the person's eyes will start closing, and then he would go to re- sleep. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts it in that order. But it's simply explaining that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always up, and He is aware of everything, and has full control over everything. لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Now, this portion of the ayah is telling us His kingdom. To him belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth. Whatever is in the heaven and whatever is in this earth, everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, not only that, he is controlling everything. Sometimes you control certain things, but they are not yours. We don't own them. And we are controlling these things, how to function, how to do things. But we don't own these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Whatever is in the heaven or earth, everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He owns everything. He has the ownership of everything that we see in heaven or earth. So, nothing is out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kingdom. He is the owner of everything. And once he is the owner of everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need anything. There is nothing that he needs from us, from other creatures. Can I get this? Can I get that? He owns everything and he owns us. مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Who can intercede with him without his permission? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power is so strong that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not only that no one can do anything without my permission, no one can take anyone anywhere he would like without my permission, no one can even intercede to me without my permission. Many times people give us the feeling or we get the feeling that someone can control my Jannah and Jahannam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says not to talk about controlling the Jannah and Jahannam for others. No one has the right to even intercede without Allah's permission. That Ya Allah, please let him go to Jannah. No one can even intercede without having a permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that, no one can even intercede, how can a person make a decision about people's Jannah and Jahannam? So, this is telling us that our destination is totally in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything 
that we do and whatever we get in our life is totally within the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He never gave other people control over it. So people cannot decide for us. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decision. مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ On the day of Qiyamah, Malaika will be there. Anbiya alayhimu salatu was salam will be there. Shuhada, salihin, great people will be there. But no one would be able to intercede. A person sees his own father being taken towards Jahannam. Someone sees his own son is being led to Jahannam, will not be able to speak a word. Someone sees his own wife, wife sees her husband being taken towards Jahannam, no one would be able to speak. If that person is in the position of interceding, still this person would not speak until will go to Allah, Ya Allah, please, I have a request. I need to intercede on behalf of someone. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Okay, go ahead, then the person would speak. Otherwise, this person would be afraid and will not say a word. Anbiya alayhimu salatu was salam will not intercede without Allah's permission. Malaika will not intercede with Allah's, without Allah's permission. Even Malaika will need a permission. Anbiya will need a permission. And if Malaika and Anbiya need permission, then who else can intercede without a permission? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be interceding on that day at different places, at different situations. And each time the hadith telling us, each time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wants to intercede, he will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission. He will seek the permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we know, the hadith says that the first intercession to start the judgment, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I would do a sujood 